welcome everyone to today's Southern Fire Exchange webinar. Thank you for joining us today. My name is David Godwin and I'm the coordinator for the Southern Fire Exchange program with the University of Florida. I'm hosting here from my office today at Tall Timbers Research Station in Tallahassee. Today we are excited to have our special guest Dr. Stephen Pine, acclaimed fire author and distinguished scholar at Arizona State University. Today, Dr. Pine will be giving a presentation on the past and present roles of wildland fire on our planet and in the U.S. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Steve Pine. Dr. Pine is a distinguished scholar and Regents Professor at Arizona State University in Phoenix, Arizona. He is arguably the most prolific, published, and well-known American wildland fire author, historian, and scholar. His interest in wildland fire grew from 18 seasons spent as a wildland firefighter with the National Park Service on the north rim of the Grand Canyon. And since then, he's published scores of books and articles, many of which delve into the complex roles of fire on Earth. Using stories, science, history, and timely metaphors, Dr. Pine has crafted a style of writing that engages and connects even non-specialists with challenging wildland fire topics. His most recent fire projects include the 2015 publication of Between Two Fires, A Fire History of Contemporary America. This book walks the reader through the complex and changing history of American fire management since the 1960s. And as a counterpart to that text, Pine and University of Arizona Press will be releasing a nine-volume series over the next few years entitled To the Last Smoke. And that'll survey the colorful regional fire stories of the U.S. through a series of essays. The Florida and California volumes were released this spring, and the Southwest and Northern Rockies volumes, volumes will be published in, next in the series. So as a, as a side, I can say personally I've been working through the Florida uh, volume right now, and it, it's quite enjoyable. So today's presentation with Dr. Pine came as a request from our own Dr. Joe Royce from NC State co-PI for the Southern Fire Exchange after he saw Steve's presentation last year at the International Wildland Fire Conference in Korea. And so they worked together to bring this program to all of us today. So welcome, Dr. Pine. We're honored to have you with us here today. And just one moment as we switch over and bring up your presentation, sir. All right. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the invitation. We are uniquely fire creatures on a uniquely fire planet. And that is really the organizing theme for this presentation. I'm, I'm going to give you in a very brief uh, compass um, some sense of what that means and how that has evolved historically. So the legacy is very old, very large, and very intimately bonded with humanity's past and future. We're talking about a phenomenon unique to Earth, a saga over 400 million years old, and a biochemical reaction a source of power that one species and only one has learned to control. We're talking about a relationship that as much as anything defines us as ecological beings. And that's about as profound a legacy as, as I can imagine. Well, for a long time, these facts informed humanity's understanding of, of Earth and our place within it. And even among the ancient elements, um, fire was the odd man out. Earth, air, water, all their substances. But fire, fire is a reaction, it synthesizes its surroundings, takes its character from its context, and that makes it a shapeshifter. And this has proved true intellectually as well. So our understanding of fire, even our definition of fire, has morphed with historical circumstances. Now, today, the other ancient elements all have academic disciplines, even whole departments dedicated to their study. The only fire department on a university campus is the one that sends emergency vehicles when an alarm sounds. A very peculiar development. Well, fire is a product of the living world. Life created the oxygen. Life created the fuels. The chemistry of fire is a biochemistry. Fire takes apart what photosynthesis puts together. It's a very old process. As soon as plants colonize land, they began to burn, and they've been burning ever since. Fossil charcoal dates back to the early Devonian. We even have uh, 
petrified trees with fire scars on them. Or to put it another way, fire is not uh, an exogenous, a physical disturbance that somehow imposes itself on the living world. Rather, it's something that emerges out of the fundamentals of life on Earth. So once established, fire is never left. But it tends to be patchy in space and time. Well, how could it be otherwise, given the fact that fire is integrating its surroundings and those surroundings constantly change? The atmosphere changes, oxygen levels change, uh, the fuels in the form of the living world uh, evolve. All of these uh, features of fire, all the things that it, it synthesizes in, in one reaction are constantly changing. And so fire, fire has changed. So there are periods, times when on Earth when fire is very active and times when it's, when it's much less so. And if you reconstruct, as some people are now, the, the long-term, very long-term history of fire, we see eras that are for which fire is richer than at other times. Uh, we see extinction events uh, tied to the uh, events of fire and so forth. So some places, some eras had fire routinely, others only episodically or rarely. And then most recently, we've come to occupy uh, a world over the last couple million years that's whipsawed between eras of fire and ice. Okay, what life could not control, however, was ignition, for this was almost wholly dependent on lightning. And then a creature arrived who could wrest ignition away from lightning. And this is a real phase change in the larger history uh, of the planet, as well as the history of fire and, of course, the history of ourselves. The hominins complete the cycle of fire for the circle of life. In truth, we have become the keystone species for fire. We now hold it as a species monopoly. You know, other creatures knock over trees, dig holes in the ground, hunt, eat grass. We do fire. It's, our, it's the signature, the unique signature of our ecological agency. And it reminds us, should remind us, that our environmental power is fundamentally a firepower. And I think today most of us in the industrial world can hardly appreciate what that possession means. As most fire origin myths proclaim, control over combustion boosted hum humanity, which was a species pretty weakly endowed to the top of the food chain. By cooking food, we could shrink our guts and enlarge our heads. By cooking landscapes, we could manipulate whole habitats. And by reaching into the geologic past for more fuels to burn, we have begun to cook the planet itself. Fire was probably our first domestication. Even the words we use to describe it, at least in English, speak to raising children. We kindle fire. We feed it. We tend it. Tools made of stone and wood are simply instrument, in, implements to be you know, stored and used. But fire is a relationship that must be continually refreshed. It forced us to adjust socially. We needed to regulate its use. We needed fire keepers. The ability to manage fire properly remains a marker of civilization. This is a frontispiece to ancient Roman uh, survey of architect architecture by Vitruvius, and it separates the civilized from the barbaric by the ability to control fire. But we can find lots of modern analogs instead. If you're a science fiction fan, you may recall Isaac Asimov's famous story, Nightfall, in which periodically the planet is destroyed by uh, these world-ending fires, and out of the ash, a new civilization, a new life and civilization emerge. But the first task of civilization is to restore fire control. So I think even Cormac McCarthy's somewhat weird but engaging uh, post-apocalyptic novel, The Road, it's the people who carry the fire responsibly who are the ones who are keeping civilization alive. So it's pretty deeply embedded uh, in our cultural understanding. Like all good relationships, each party gave and got. People rearranged fire and took it to places that didn't previously have it. And people got fire practices that framed the rituals of vernacular life. To kindle a fire was the first act of a day. To bank its coals, the last. 
Around daily fires, hearths, forges, bonfires, candles, we met to eat, to play, to work. Around evening fires, we told the stories that spoke to who we are. Because it was so elemental to human experience, fire became itself an integral part of ritual and ceremony, and in many cases, of worship. Fire lies close to the core of most technologies. What it does in ecosystems, the way it works as a general biotic catalyst, it does in human technologies as well. Again, cooking was an early model. So we could cook ore into metal, limestone into cement, sand into glass, mud into brick, wood into tar. We could distill raw matter into fluids and gas, into turpentine, spirits, gasoline. Later we could ignite explosives. The early Roman naturalist Pliny the Elder posed the question that still haunts our appreciation of fire. And he, he plays on a, a, a trope, as it was called, a, a metaphor that there were two natures around us. One, the nature of the first nature, which existed quite apart from people, what we would think of as wild nature. And then second nature, the nature that people, through artifice and intelligence and craft, had fashioned out of it. And he ponders that the conclusion to his survey of the ways in which human intelligence calls art to its aid in counterfeiting nature, that is, changing first nature to second nature, we cannot but marvel at the fact that fire is necessary for almost every operation. And then he begins cataloging it, and it is astonishing how thoroughly fire saturated uh, life and practices. Fire lay pretty close to the core of chemistry. It's no surprise that alchemists <clears throat> sought to exploit fire to transmute dross into gold because that's how they that's how fire how they saw fire seemingly transmuting everything it touched certainly that's what it did in the world around them fire was power it was a social power that demanded duties it was a technological power that made and leveraged other tools it was an intellectual power that illuminated and explained it was an ecological power that reshaped the landscapes. So the possession of fire demanded choices. It required responsibilities to match our firepower. And very likely the capture of fire was our first Faustian bargain. Well, our power took two forms. One came by manipulating fire within something like its natural context, but we can call this open burning. The other came by isolating fire especially within special combustion chambers. We can call this, for our purposes, let's call it closed burning. The problem with open burning or landscape fire was that it comes with severe limitations. Fire's power derives from the power to propagate, and that lies with the environment. So not every spark kindles, not every kindling spreads or behaves as we would wish. Free burning fire obeys wind and terrain and the ecological arrangement of combustibles not always human will. Well, this condition really didn't change until we began to alter landscapes to make them more fire prone. We could slash woods, drain peat, kill off megafauna, loose livestock, all of which can make more fuel available. That is, we no longer control just the spark of ignition, we begin to control more of its environmental context. And for fire history, this, I think, is the meaning of agriculture. If the hearth fire was, the, was modeled on tending children, landscape fire was modeled on hunting game and shepherding flocks. Outside of floodplains, almost all farming and herding required that catalytic jolt of fire. And I think this also proposes an explanation for fallowing, which European agronomists have hated for several thousand years. At least we have that much in print. They thought it was a waste of land for people who were always on the verge of famine. And worse, uh, all that wasteland was, was then burned, which was dangerous and noxious and just aggravated sort of this, the superstitious uh, sense that following uh, was completely illogical. I suggest, however, that you could pick up the other end of that stick and say that the land, the fallow wasn't burned to get rid of it. It was grown in order to be burned. Because at some point, 
in the cycling of, land, of farms around the landscape or the cycling of landscapes through crop rotation uh, on a farm, you needed that catalytic jolt of fire. And the way to get that in an agricultural setting was to grow it. And that was what fowl was about. Even so, our firepower remains limited by how much we can coax or coerce out of the living landscape. Take too much, and the system spirals down. And this has too often been the narrative of anthropogenic fire. We push and push the system until it breaks. But if we want more power, and it seems we always do, we had to find another source of fuel. And that leads to the second expression of our firepower, closed closed burning, and this too had limits. Um, if we relied on surface biomass, we could quickly exhaust the landscape. But if we were willing to reach into lithic landscapes, move back into the geologic past, um, I'm sorry, I've gotten something, we've missed something in the sequencing here, let me, all right, something's out of order, but it's fine. We will deal with it. The point here, you should have seen a slide of industrial fire, and uh, I'll show it, I think it appears later. And the point here is that we find a new source of combustibles to burn. And that source are lithic landscapes, that is, uh, fossil fuels, which I think uh, can also be thought of as a kind of fossil fallow. So these two systems, um, these systems begin to cross in the latter part of the Enlightenment, uh, particularly in the 19th century. And it allowed us to overcome the, the limitation of fuel. Uh, but it also has brought its own costs. So we began in this closed combustion cycle to put more and more things into machine. Here's James Watt. The quote is from his business partner, Matthew Bolton, who says, I sell here, sir, what all the world desires to have, power. Uh, Pretty blunt commentary, but I think it reminds us that these machines were about power. It reminds us that these machines were fire machines. They were fire engines. And in a weird sort of way, self sort of recursive way, it's worth remarking that the first engines were used uh, to drain coal mines to produce more fuel. So there was kind of this weird um, uh, feedback loop going on. So there's a, a transition period. There's the slide that was missing in the background. Uh, a new kind of fire is upon the earth, and that is going to compete with the other kinds of fire. And I think of this transition, this period where you're moving from primarily burning living landscapes to burning lithic ones as a pyric transition. Uh, and I think it has a kind of logic to it, which I can see historically. And at the beginning, uh, in the early onset of this, you have an explosion of fires. Um, fire is abusive, uh, it's reckless, much like a pop human populations undergoing industrialization, uh, there is basically an explosion of burning, uh, which appears to be very damaging. And then, as the new order begins to impose itself, um, the population collapses. In fact, falls below replacement values, so that fully Industrialized societies find that they have a fire deficit. Uh, so we go from fire orgy to, in a sense, fire famine. And we do it by substituting pyrotechnologies, by actively suppressing, and by rearranging land use, how we, how we live on the land, how we exploit things. All of this relies on the peculiar kind of power we derive uh, from these new prime movers. Interestingly enough, as we uh, begin controlling fire, we rely on these very machines to do it. So we are really combating fire is fighting fire, but closed combustion against open. And this has, of course, its consequences. Another interesting dimension to this is that fire goes from a fundamental phenomenon and an informing principle to something else. In other words, intellectually, there was also a pyric transition. Fire had been, since ancient times, recognized as one of the fundamental features of the world, and in, to many minds, uh, the fundamental model for change. Even in Aristotelian physics, 
Fire was the model system. If you couldn't explain fire, you couldn't explain change. All that is about to go, and at the same time, we begin removing fire in all of its manifestations for, from our daily life, uh, in, encasing it, finding substitutes, uh, removing it, such that out of sight becomes out of mind. And fire, it's exactly at this time that fire begins to disappear from intellectual discourse as a kind of informing presence. So we go from open burning to alternative substitutes that are not even fire anymore. It becomes a subset of oxidation chemistry, of thermodynamics, of electromagnetism, even of physiology. Uh, it disappears as an integrated and integral subject and becomes um, a part, in many ways an overlooked or forgotten part of others. I don't know what's happened. We're having some really freaky slide transmutations going on here. That's the agricultural slide. And now we're going, okay, we're back on order a little bit. And uh, this transition, however, uh, has created a, a new world order. The ancient rhythms of fire and life are scrambled. We're accustomed to thinking, you know, a fire history is largely a subset of natural history, particularly of climate history. But in our new dispensation, natural history, including climate, may be becoming subsets of fire history. The old order of burning came with all kinds of ecological boundaries and checks and balances. The new order of burning can burn day and night, winter and summer, through drought and deluge, ice age and interglacial. Our new firepower has become a force multiplier for whatever we do. The Anthropocene has become shorthand for planetary changes of all kinds, but behind the Anthropocene lies humanity's hand on a new engine of combustion. In fact, we might we might begin thinking about an alternative expression for the era as a pyrocene. I think that fire and its byproducts are washing over the planet in the same way that, that ice did uh, for the Pleistocene. So fire may be returning. Uh, the problem is no longer finding enough stuff to burn. The problem increasingly is finding enough, enough places to store all the effluent. And it may come back from the fringe. It may be seen as a driver of the Anthropocene, in which case the narrative of fire will be restored uh, to a kind of uh, status as prime mover. As I mentioned, this pyric transition runs like a terminator through a lot of Earth history. These are scenes from uh, 19th century America when this was in a uh, full-throated roar. Uh, my favorite image Upper right, coastal redwoods converted to dairy farms. Uh, we can find analogs today in places in Brazil, Indonesia. Uh, we went through all of this um, in our own time. But that wreckage did not go unrecorded or unnoticed, and it gave rise, uh, in many cases, to programs of state-sponsored conservation. Now, these were particularly prone in uh, European colonies, where Europe was uh, was an imperial power and could impose its ideas a lot easier on a foreign population than it could on uh, on its own own pocket national populations. It also applied to countries um, that had large public estates. Uh, again, thanks to the nature of their colonizing, the removal of indigenous people on a large scale, and uh, the subsequent claim and management of these lands by instruments of the state. And at this time, that would, that would point towards some program of state-sponsored conservation to save the remaining lands from what was called fire and axe. And it's of immense importance that at this time, responsibility for this task was given to forestry. Um, forestry became the oracle, and in a way, the engineer of free-burning fire. Forestry, in many ways, was very ill-equipped for this task. It had grown up as a subset of agriculture uh, in Central Europe, uh, an area that has no natural basis for fire, no wet and dry seasons, no dry lightning, for which fire was seen and can legitimately be seen as simply a problem of human control. So foresters from their origin uh, were hostile to fire, uh, dedicated efforts to control it, 
sponsored research, but with the idea of finding better ways to control it, and if possible, ultimately to remove it. So this is a, a very strange freak of history with very powerful consequences. Okay, this was a global project. It's worth uh, it's worth considering. So here we have a uh, early U.S. Forest Service ranger in the Northern Rockies on fire patrol. On the right, from the central provinces of India, uh, we have our fire lookout up in the tree. Uh, he has a large drum in the lower center. Uh, when he spots smoke, he will go down, beat out a message uh, to the local villagers to come help control the fire. The problem was that the villagers were the ones who set the fires. So it was not a very successful program. It was bitterly hated uh, by the indigenous peoples. But fire control was taken by uh, British, forestry, British forestry in India, almost all of it managed by Germans, uh, as, as simply a foundation principle. Interestingly enough, uh, Rudyard Kipling wrote about it. He wrote a sequel to the Jungle Books in which he uh, describes what happens to Mowgli after he grows up. Goes to the man village, grows up. Hey, what happens as an adult? He joins the Indian Forest Service and becomes a fire guard. And I love that because it shows just how powerful these notions were among uh, intellectuals and progressive thinkers of the time. Whether you consider Kipling progressive or not, or not, he was certainly at this at this part time in his life um, well placed uh, to convey the prevailing sentiments. And very briefly, again, there's British India, uh, Dietrich Brandis, the botanist turned forester who set up the program, one of the great figures, 19th century forester and uh, colonial uh, conservation. Uh, Gifford Pinchot modeled himself, in some ways after Brandis, studied briefly with Brandis, wrote that he hoped to do in this country something of what Brandis had achieved in India. And there's the growth of forest reserves in India, and at the same time, the growth of public lands, particularly national forests in the United States. These were projects that were, that were conducted around the world. So the idea was to save these lands, spare them from axe and fire, but paradoxically, you wound up creating a permanent habitat for fire. And you think about those countries that have cognate fire programs and problems to ours, like Australia, Canada, Russia, they all have a similar colonial history in the creation of similar lands and the response to those large lands uh, by conservation programs. These were exported throughout the world. And uh, up until fairly recent times, and still in some parts of the world, this is taken as the evidence of modernity is to have an active fire control program. So let me give you, since I've been working on this project for the last few years, let me give you a very brief thumbnail sketch of how this plays out in the U.S. After events of 1910, the Forest Service becomes serious about fire, becomes the matrix for a national program, creating a national infrastructure uh, for fire, fire research, uh, every aspect of fire, uh, federal, state cooperation, all of it. It was very much modeled on the elimination of all threats by eliminating all fires. So that in 1935, a 10 a.m. policy is announced. Why then? Because the CCC was available, which seemed to make it present. And then in the post-war eras, lots and lots of surplus military equipment could replace the CCC, sort of mechanical muscle, and continue what was um, seen as a war on fire. And then 50 years or so ago, we began. Uh, to see, recognize the consequences of this. Uh, we didn't like consolidating everything into a single institution. We didn't like having a single policy for what were very widespread and varied lands. And the problem of eliminating all fires means that you also eliminated good fires as well as bad. So there's an effort to, uh, to restore fire, to put good fire back in, since they were being broadcast out of tall timbers. 1962 makes a good year, the first of the Tall Timbers Fire Conferences. That's also uh, the first year the Nature Conservancy conducted uh, prescribed fire, uh, shown here in Minnesota. And then um, in short order, remarkably short order as we look back on it, it seemed forever if you were living through at the time, why couldn't, didn't people understand this and, and respond immediately? 
but in relatively short uh, span of time, the agencies fall in. The, the National Park Service reforms its policy in 1968, renounces the 10 a.m. policy, uh, seeks to restore fire. Uh, indeed, the torch is being passed to a new generation. And uh, by 1978, the Forest Service had followed, and interior agencies in one form or another were also stumbling towards the same arrangement. That is, in, you know, in, in, in something like 16 years from the opening salvo, the old order, uh, at least intellectually, uh, collapses. Uh, I find that astonishing. So by 1978, the Forest Service has got the policies, reforms and in institutions and so forth that were adequate to do what people thought needed to be done. So it was a project of fire by prescription, direct prescribed fire, also ways of introducing more room for natural fire, calling them prescribed natural fires. It's an unstable term, it keeps changing. We're still struggling what to call it and what to do with it. And equally remarkable, expand the options for fighting wildfire. You can control in the old sense or contain or confine. A remarkably flexible approach. So the issue becomes what happened? Why didn't it follow through? Well, there was, in effect, uh, a counter revolution. Uh, as I see it, there's a change in politics. Everything begins polarizing. Uh, everything up to this had been pretty much bipartisan environmental reforms. That's going to um, that's going to change. Forest Service is going to be uh, put into a very difficult position of having to, at the same time, it's responding to environmental reforms, scale up the big tree logging and the rest of it, and it's going to be progressively disabled. And this matters whether you like the agency or not. It matters because we had created a national fire system based on the Forest Service. And if you dismantle that project, you have got to find ways to put it back together. It turns out, as in many things, a lot easier to break something than to make something. And we're still struggling uh, to put all the pieces back together. That said, uh, the next change, the revolution sort of reboots in the 90s. 94 is the big season. Yeah, I've got a slide of Yellowstone in the background. That was important for the media. It was important in some ways for the public. It didn't change policy. Uh, didn't really affect uh, that much, uh, perhaps peculiarly. 94 was the season where things flipped. In effect, the revolution starts over again. I think that has, I think we've run our second sort of 50 year period. And I think we're on the cusp of something we might call a resilience model. It's going to be different, a different generation. I think, um, particularly in the West, the recognition is pretty pervasive in the field that we're not going to get ahead of these problems. Uh, we're not going to treat it, restore uh, some kind of prescribed burning uh, adequately on a scale and on a time uh, to meet the threats coming at us that we're, we're going to be doing something different. So I think this is to be announced, but I, that's how I would, in a very brief compass, uh, look at the past century of American fire history. So let's back off widen our aperture, go back to a satellite view of things. And I'm sure you've all seen these kinds of images, Earth at night. There are lots of forms to it. And what I find striking is how there are two realms of combustion. One still based on burning living landscapes, overwhelmingly, and another based on fossil burning lithic landscapes. Okay, a lot of those lights are being powered by atomic energy in France. There's hydropower, a variety of things. But for the most part, we can take this as a proxy for uh, the conversion from open burning to uh, closed uh, or fossil fuel burning. And this is pretty much the divide we see. Interestingly enough, there are very few places that have both. At any one place, you tend to have one or the other, although there may be some transition period between them. You can see some striking examples of this. And so the talk was given in Korea originally. Uh, there's North Korea. There are, again, lots of versions of this. This is from a space shuttle, conspicuous by the absence of light. But if you look at the MODIS satellite imagery for roughly the same period, you find, and it's kind of creepy, how much of the open burning captured is exactly confined within 
uh, those state borders. So we're often told that fire uh, doesn't respect borders, doesn't know borders. Well, I think it respects the DMZ. Uh, that seems to be a pretty strong demarcation line. But it also represents two very different societies that are in a different relationship to their larger history of fire and what I think of as the pirate transition. So we have uh, two general realms of combustion. And in short order, let me, let me distill the, the longer history of fire. Hundreds of millions of years. Almost all the history of, of Earth and fire has been under patterns of natural fire, patchy space and time. You can see I'm no graphic artist, and this will show even more the next one. Then we have this era of anthropogenic fire, where people begin changing ignition patterns, uh, recoding uh, landscapes, um, altering the way that fire is going to appear, changing in a fundamental way uh, the pyrogeography of Earth and the, the regimes of fire. And then we come to this more recent era of industrial fire. And I, I'm trying to indicate here that this is a thick landscape because we're taking stuff out of the geologic past, burning it, and releasing it into the geologic future. And that, that is a different kind of landscape. I think of that as a, a thick, uh, historically thick landscape. And what the big loser in all this has tended to be anthropogenic fire shrunk dramatically from what it used to be. I mean, it's gone out of most houses, it's gone out of factories, it's gone out of workplaces, uh, working fires uh, have gone, even ceremonial fires. It's harder to, harder to get bonfires. Or, hey, at my university, students are prohibited from having candles in dorms. Okay, extreme, but that's where, where this goes. On the other hand, it has liberated uh, because industrial societies like wildlands and like nature preserves, it has liberated natural fire and uh, in many ways has created realms for wildfire to return. So if we think about it as a problem of sustainability, we have the issue is that we have two kinds, two realms of fire, three kinds of fire. How do we divide three into two and have something left over? Because if we fail, we simply seed, yield those landscapes to feral fire. Well, how we handle that is going to depend on how we understand not only fire, but the world and our place in it. I, I like this this image. This is from the 2003 Aspen fire north of Tucson. There's Biosphere 2, um, completely engineered, uh, self-contained world, a sustainable world. Uh, a world that could, in theory, be plopped down on Mars and made to function. It has no tolerance, zero tolerance for fire. None. In the background, Santa Catalina Mountains, wildland, patches of it in wilderness, an area in full-throated wildfire. Uh, this is an area for which fire is inevitable and essential. And we seem to be caught very much between these two extremes. This is another version of the wildland urban interface. It's not just along the fringes of those. It's an intellectual border as well, and, and on a landscape scale, a border. How do we reconcile these two competing images of fire uh, and our place to it? What I find most striking about this and most of our images is that there's no middle ground here. Uh, and by that, I mean uh, an image, a narrative, which shows us in the picture using fire as we have for all of our existence as a species, using fire to make a more habitable landscape, using it as a, a broker uh, on behalf of the biota, if you will. So let me wrap up by going back to the fundamentals. That is, is to say fire in the living landscape, ourselves as holders of the torch. I think we have two grand narratives at play. And one is the, call it the Promethean story. And this speaks to fire as a, as a technological power, something abstracted from its setting, perhaps by violence, certainly held in defiance of an existing order. This is fire as simple combustion, sustained by boundless reserves of fossil fuel. So much burning is now occurring and will likely accelerate that we're rewiring the, the Earth's biosphere, even as its effluents unhinge the planet's climate. The other story, call it a primeval narrative, 
and it speaks to fire as a companion on our journey, as a shared bond with the living world we inhabit. It stresses our role as a steward. Uh, it notes that our failure to keep good fire in the land is destabilizing the earth as much as our promotion of bad fire. It stresses our firepower is not based ultimately on technological triumphalism, but on a relationship, and an unequal one at that, because we could vanish and fire would go on. But if fire disappeared, so would we. And I like this. This, this painting is actually the first uh, recorded image by Europeans of Australian Aborigines. It was on Cook's first voyage to Australia. And I love the fact that the uh, kid has got the fire stick. So this is the hottest and driest of all the vegetated continents. And they're walking around, kids walking around, um, you know, scattering embers wherever they go. Well, they've worked fire in this landscape for so many thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, that, that it works fine. And how else is the kid going to learn how to burn? No wonder he's got a smile on his face. So. As we enter the future, the Earth is shedding its ice ages for a fire age. Our relationship to fire has made that possible. Our past is a narrative of how we have used our firepower, and our future will be a narrative of what we have learned from that experience. What is constant, however, I, I would argue, is our defining relationship with fire. And that's why I believe that when the time comes to tell that tale, will probably choose to do it around a fire. So thank you very much, and I apologize. I don't know what was going on. David and I went through the slides yesterday, and everything seemed to be in order, and there were some glitches, and I apologize for that, but I hope the, uh, the main message came through. And I'm very happy to take questions now. All right, well, well thank you, Steve. Uh, sorry about the issues that came up with the slides. Uh, once again, if you all in the audience joined us during the presentation, uh, my name is David Godwin, and I'm the coordinator for the Southern Fire Exchange, and we just had a great survey of the role of fire on Earth by Dr. Stephen Pine. Uh, so we do have some time remaining in our hour uh, for questions. Uh, so if you have questions, uh, please go ahead and um, and type that those into the chat window. And, uh, and we'll field those and, and let Dr. Pine address them. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, start things off. And I have a question here for you. And coming from the side of the Southern Fire Exchange and, and being interested in communicating uh, fire concepts and messages, you know, there would, there's some that would say that you're, you're the closest, you know, we have, we're, you're a, cel a celebrity in, in the wildland fire and fire science communities. And you've become a leading voice for wildland fire issues, uh, for policy and for science. And, and you're our most famous fire author. You're almost always quoted in the national medias on, on artic articles and, and fire. And, and you've you testified in Washington, D.C. And yet, you're a historian, uh, you're an author, and you're a scholar. So you're, you're not a fire scientist and you're not a fire manager per se. And so what what do you think the fire scientists could learn from the fact that a historian with a talent for metaphors is, has come to lead the discussions in their field? Well thanks for the uh, the kind words. I hope I hope they're uh, they have some approximation of truth behind them. I, I, I'm flattered but uh, you may be granting me, I'm sure you are granting me far too much status. Let me let me back that off another step and say what is the, the most influential publication I can think of in the last, uh, say, 40 years on fire was written um, by a professor of Renaissance literature at the University of Chicago, and that's Norman McLean's Young Men in Fire, mm -hmm. which directly affected fire policy uh, and how we, how we do things in the field. My argument is not, I, I would hate to have this go back to the sciences versus the humanities. Who's right? Um, who should we get it? I think the issue is, is that if we want to tackle the problem, not just understand the science, but we want to address the problem, we have got to have everybody on the field. We've got to clear the bench. We need everybody out there. 
and we all have different gifts. We all have different talents. I am not a scientist. I have never claimed to be a scientist. I certainly read enough science, mm -hmm. uh, but then I try to, I try to convert it into narrative. I try to convert it into other things uh, that can speak to the public. And on on a presentation like this, which I've now given twice to uh, fire audiences, you don't see a lot of traditional fire imagery in there. Mm -hmm. uh, I use a lot of paintings. Um, I use lots of some historic stuff. And there's, there's a subtext here. And the subtext is that fire is a part of our culture. And if we disregard that, we're not going to succeed. And don't, I don't want to be misinterpreted with what I'm going to say here. But I think particularly from the Southeast, your group will get it. If you have a, a working fire culture, you can have successful fire regimes, fire landscapes, with or without a fire science. But if you have a fire science, no matter how impressive, and it isn't, you don't have a fire culture, you're not going to have working fire in the landscape. So the reason the South has, be, has been exceptional, uh, and in many ways has led the pushback, uh, to getting fire back in the landscape is because that fire culture was never completely extinguished. And it has been uh, sequestered, it's been changed, uh, it's been given some discipline, bureaucratic discipline, legal discipline, scientific discipline, but that culture is something that you can build on. And that is not true in other, in other places. So I see my task as, as trying to connect with the larger society, which is not going to care a hoot about fuel loads and arguing over thinning 16 versus 14 inch diameters and all the rest of it. They couldn't care less. They have to have some kind of story that engages them and they have to understand that fire really matters to their, to our national identity. And I would argue even to our species identity. And it's worth paying attention for those reasons. Very good. All right. Let's, we'll take a question here that came in on the chat pod. We had one from Paul Dean, and he says, on average, is the total acreage of prescribed burning in the southeast on the decline? And and if so, could you comment on the primary reason for this, he says? Well, that's a good question. Um, I have to tell you that fire statistics are really dreadful. <laughs> uh, and for and for a community that considers itself science informed, our metrics are pretty awful. Um, I don't mean that as a slam. It just means it's very hard to talk about fire. The Forest Service talked, hey, last year it was a record, 10 million acres. Well, 5 million was in Alaska. What are the other 5 million? How does that compare? I mean, these statistics are really, really poor. And I would urge the fire science community to get some real metrics and get some better metrics for, for ecological burning, not just fuel reduction. So are we reducing or not? Um, in some ways, we have great success stories about expanding burning. But I think if you look at the larger picture, more and more of that burning is on uh, select lands, a shrinking land base. So my guess is, as I see it, satellite surveillance view, is that the amount of land burned in aggregate will shrink and continue to shrink uh, as long as we are driven by economic considerations, um, sort of simple, simply presented matters of public safety, uh, and just the whole pirate transition. Hey, if fire is just a tool to reduce fuel, we'll be told to find another tool that doesn't smoke up uh, highways. Um, if fire, however, is an ecological process that's doing biological work that nothing else really does, we need that fire, then that's a different argument. So um, I, think, I think on our preserves, where we are interested in matters like ecological integrity and so forth, uh, fire use is going to expand. We're going to see more fire, more burning, either by wildfire or prescribed fire. But in the general landscape, that larger vernacular landscape, where people have used fire all around them all the time, uh, you can see it still today in places in Brazil and Africa. I personally had a chance to witness it. Just it's just a part of the landscape. That kind of fire is going. So here's another question in from Joe 
in the chat pod. And he says, were you implying that Western megafires are a result of the amount of wildlands out west, i.e. all the public lands, versus the large acreage of anthropogenic fires in the east are as a result of the large amount of privately managed fires in the east? Well, there's certainly a difference east and west. Uh, the western land land Escapes are different because of the large public lands. And when we think about the kinds of fire um, institutions, large, particularly suppression, but even management that we see comparable in Australia, Russia, Canada, and so forth, those are all based on the possession of these very, very extensive um, wildlands. And to have really big fires, you have to have really big. Uh, expanses of land. So I think that's that's generally true. The south is getting, south is very interesting, southeast is interesting because land use changes, as I see it, uh, are really moving very quickly. And as you begin developing, uh, taking land out of production, uh, you're also creating a lot more feral landscapes that will start to burn. Uh, and you're starting to see some of these. Uh, the hope in the southeast is that the tradition of prescribed burning, in the sense that I have, that it's it's really an informing principle. You'd like to prescribe burn first. You'll fight fires when you have to, and you do a lot of both. Um, I think that, that you have a chance to sort of contain it. So you will have different kinds of fires. Uh, you may have fairly large complexes like the one around Okefenokee um, a few years ago. Uh, but that also involved a lot of public land. So, you know, otherwise we're into the European model. The European model of fire is that you cultivate it out of the system, which is great unless you want any of those wild, <laughs> want those wild habitats for one reason or another, and you don't really have a basis, natural basis for fire. So the European model uh, is really limited. Um, I think I've danced around that question without really answering it. I think it's clear that the really large mega fires that we're, we're seeing and will continue to see are going to be the result of large lands, and those are going to be public lands in the West and Alaska. So while we wait to see if we have any more questions to come in there, I'll, I'll add um, on top of Joe's question, you're coming from the southeast. Uh, I've born, raised, and educated in the south. You know, I, t I tend to see one way of looking at fire in our region is as a as a gardening tool, right? Mm -hmm. It's a it's a transformative tool for for shaping our landscapes into something that we want, whatever that is. And um, and and I think you you have you've hit on that idea in your Florida Fire Survey book and that you know that gardening fire is is, is a tool for achieving those sorts of desired future conditions whatever that is and what, what whatever you're working towards yeah. and that seems like that has worked pretty well in the south um, and you, again you just hit on that a little bit where where you could see this as, as a cultivated landscape right yeah and and so that almost the whole region in some way or another has has been torn up by a plow or by an axe or both and it's now uh, chopped up by roads and so you know these the vast un landscapes that you see in the American West are are pretty rare in our region and and so then are we trying to take a concept to prescribe fire that was cultivated in the south in a way tall timbers etc and then it was cultivated in a cultivated landscape so to speak and then yeah. prescribe that to the American West um, and you know starting in the 1960s we, we've seen that the, the prescribed fire has arguably failed to live up to its prescription in the region and so is that are, are we trying to apply a model from the east to a region where it, it may not work? 
Yeah, I think that's a very perceptive observation. I mean, in a sense, it's the flip side. Uh, Florida was subject to notions of fire suppression that were cultivated in the northern Rockies, basically, in, in parts of California, and then, uh, you know, imposed on Florida, and they didn't work, and it took a long time to work it out. I think when people began with prescribed burning, which is really, I mean, another variant of what humanity has always done. That is how we have used fire on landscapes in one form or another for all of our existence. Uh, have taken that, they looked at it, and they said, you know, this is a universal principle. There's no reason why it can't apply everywhere. Why can't it work in the West? It should. You just, you're just, uh, you know, you're dragging your feet. You're just not being clever. You're not taking the proper risk. You're not doing this, that, and the other. And I have to tell you, the more and more we look at it, we see that prescribed fire is pretty much a regional phenomenon. It's it's regional in the southeast and regional in parts of uh, the Great Plains, mm -hmm. of the Flint Hills and some of the uh, prairie restoration projects. It has not translated well elsewhere. And I think that you're dealing not just with natural uh, landscapes and transcendent principles and scientifically derived uh, insight, you're dealing with culture landscapes, and in the West, the whole wilderness notion, and the idea that you want wild land, and you want lots of other things, makes it extremely difficult to go in and intervene. Um, I, I find it's even eerie. I mean, in Florida, for example, uh, all the birds that are endangered seem to uh, be leveraged for increasing fire, where it's Florida scrub jay or red cockaded woodpecker. All the birds in the West push the system the other way, whether it's spotted owls or sage grouse. It keeps pushing the system the other way. So I think in the West, what you're going to wind up with, what we're already seeing on the ground, is a kind of managed wildfire, mm -hmm. that they are going to have to find ways to use the fires, which they are not setting, which cost too much. The liability issues are horrendous. All of the issues, political cost is too high. Uh, use those fires to get their burning done, and they're going to take some collateral damage, you know, 15, 20, 25 percent, maybe those those fires that they're corralling, loose herding, trying to run around the scene for a bit. Uh, some significant fraction may be more severely burned than they would want, certainly well outside of prescription, but that means that maybe 60 or 70 percent did get a burn that would be tolerable. And they're not going to be able to get ahead of these problems. And I think some kind of managed wildfire is going to be the way fire gets restored. And I think in the West, the challenge is going to be, we have these large fires, even if we back off, go really, really indirect, uh, box and burn some of these big fires, uh, we're going to have still patchy landscapes afterwards. How do we go in and build new landscapes that we like out of those out of those that have been left. And also, better, smarter use of fire behavior. We're not having to do our burnouts under emergency conditions, and we're doing far too much damage with the burning out. There's no excuse for that. So I think there's a lot of science could come into play. How do we do this better than we are? But I think that's what's going to be, that is what for the West in that setting is going to be the equivalent of prescribed fire in the Southeast. So, so, in a way, these managed wildfires may be our, our cultivated plow of the West that we then go in and take advantage of moving forward. Yeah, I think they're going to create a, a matrix for landscape, new matrices. And we not, you know, we have one of these big fires. We have Wallow Fire, 540,000 acres in Arizona. I was thinking, wow, the next year, if I were a fire officer and I had the money and the power to do it, I would be in that next year of burning. And I would be burning out a lot of those patches that were that were skipped. Because you, it's not going to go anywhere. <sighs> You've got some deep black landscape all around you. This is the time to go in and do some of that cleanup and reset that landscape. And instead, no, we just had this horrible fire. We've got to rest. Well, now we've, we've probably let, let, let one fire cycle go. Even since the fire has occurred, we probably missed a fire cycle. And that requires thinking differently than I think of as the Southeast prescribed fire model, you know, where you lay it out, it's a kind of a set piece, um, and, uh, you know, you get ahead of it, and you gradually substitute your 
tame fire for these feral fires. And I just don't see outside selective areas. I mean, sequoia groves, maybe some municipal watersheds, really special areas around communities. Other than that, we're not going to get ahead of this problem. Uh, too many things are coming at us. They're all out of control. Uh, all we can do is try to you know, come through this and keep ourselves and as much of the landscape uh, healthy as, as, as we can. So I think it's a very interesting time. It's going to require some different thinking, and I think it's going to require a different model. The last 50 years, what I think of as the fire revolution, was really predicated on a kind of fire by prescription model. And I, I'm not saying that that's over. I'm saying that that as a ruling model that in principle could be transported everywhere, I think that era is probably over. And we're going to have sort of regional models. And they're going to be quite different. And the West, the West uh, isn't going to be like the Southeast. It's going to have to find its own way. And that goes both ways. It's no good trying to impose something out of Southern California on Southern Florida, but it doesn't make sense to take something out of the Red Hills region and think that that's going to work in Montana. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Pine, for joining us today. Thank you for your presentation and, and for taking the time to respond to the, to the question and answer period at the end. Well, my pleasure. I, I hope you found something of use in it. So thanks, everyone in the audience who joined us today. And we hope that this webinar will be useful in your fire management and fire research programs. And thank you, especially Dr. Pine, for joining us and taking the time. And have a great afternoon, everyone. Mm -hmm.